Good morning, and thank you for coming to the beautiful Durba Hall to listen to this beautiful panel. Um, you're very lucky, you're in for a big, big treat. May I present Anosh Irani, born and raised in Bombay, and as a Britisher, I'm allowed to say Bombay because that's what he says, that's how we take our cues. Uh, he lives now in Vancouver, Canada. Uh, his work has been translated into 11 languages, and this book, The Parcel, is his fourth book. It's been shortlisted, uh, longlisted, sorry, for the DSC Prize for South Asian Literature. And uh, it's focused on the people who live in and around the red light district, Kamatipura, in Mumbai, Bombay. I just, sorry, I always have to do that inflection. Um, and it's about this extraordinary woman, a Hijra woman whose name is Madhu, and a child, a trafficked child who falls into her care. Um, so we'll be hearing more from that. I also want to introduce Sandeep Roy, who used to work as a software engineer in the US and now lives in Kolkata and does this. This is so much better. It's a little more. Interesting. Yes. So I'm glad you came back. Uh, also uh, 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 on the list for the DSC, so they're, you know, they're prize list brethren. Um, this book, Don't Let Him Know, is Sandeep's debut novel. It's about secrets. It's about secrets within families. It plays out in Calcutta and in California, and in this sort of godforsaken town called Carbondale. <laughs> I'm glad you went there so we don't have to. Um, and it's, it's a, a, a truly beautiful read. And I think I might, before we, before we, before we go into the fascinating themes of, of, of gender stereotype, of role play, of isolation, of transgression, I'm going to ask them both to read from their work. Um, I'll start with you, Anosh. There's a particular section. We should, we should clarify, when you hear the words of the parcel, it's referring to a small child. And you, perhaps you could clarify very slightly before you, you start your reading. So, uh, good morning everyone and thanks for being here. It's a nice intimate crowd and um, we can actually hear ourselves today, which is, which is nice. Um, so, my novel, The Parcel, is set in um, Kamatipura, which is the red light district in uh, Bombay. And I use both Bombay and Mumbai in my writing. I somehow use the word Mumbai more now. Uh, when I speak, I naturally say the word Bombay. Um, so it's the story of, um, of a person named Madhu who belongs to the Hijra community. And uh, Madhu is a, a retired sex worker. And one day she gets a call from Padma, who is one of the most powerful brothel madams in Kamadipura. A parcel has arrived and parcel is code for a young girl who's been trafficked into the brothels. And it is Madhu's job to train this girl and prepare her for what's to come. And it's really a story of two lost, broken souls, in a, in a way, finding themselves uh, in, in extremely tragic uh, circumstances. Uh, the section that I'm going to read um, takes place, you know, quite towards the end. Uh, and I'm, I'm glad B, you asked me to read this. I've never read this section before, so I'm really happy to, to do that today. Um, so in this section, uh, Padma has uh, told Madhu that the client um, it has asked for a photograph of the parcel. And this is what happens when she, she wants to take that picture of this girl who's only 10 years old. In one swift stroke, Padma would recover every single rupee she had spent on the parcel. On the first night, the parcel would fetch Padma at least 10 times her cost. And yet, the parcel would remain a slave for years. They were in Salma's room. Madhu had dressed the parcel up in clothes that Salma had bought for her at the midnight market. The lighting in the room was too dim, the surroundings too bleak, and Madhu was having a hard time trying to make the parcel look fresh. She looked young, but the skin underneath her eyes was sunken. This was the first time a client had asked for a photograph. Normally, flesh was flesh. Do you know why I'm taking your picture? Asked Madhu. Yes. The firmness of the parcel's reply surprised Madhu and made her snap the picture almost involuntarily. 
the result was a bit hazy. You want to show it to someone, said the parcel. Who? A man. That's right, said Madhu. Now sit still, you're moving. But the parcel was not. It was Madhu's hand that was moving, struggling to get the right composition for the photograph. She took two more shots and noticed how the parcel was staring straight into the camera without any shyness or fear. She was trying to say something to Madhu or to the man who would finally see the photograph. Tonight, the parcel had a different quality. Why are you doing this? asked the parcel. Quiet, said Madhu, sit still. The phone's battery was dying and Madhu was frustrated. Please, said the parcel, tell me. It wasn't the first time a parcel had asked Madhu this question, but the coldness in her voice was new. She had stopped pleading. She just honestly wanted to know. I'm trying to take a picture, said Madhu. You will not help me this time, said the parcel. I will, said Madhu. A final click. She got the picture she needed. It was the size of a passport photograph, but it captured the parcel's entire body. There was no emotion on her face, just the facts. Black hair, black eyes, and so on. The photo was ordinary and had a grainy look about it. It gave the impression that this girl was somewhere far away. It also suggested that there was an aura of simplicity about the girl. She did not know too much or think too much and would perhaps not offer much resistance. Satisfied, Madhu took out an opium pill from the pouch in her sari. I want you to take this, she said. I want to see the effect it has on you. I will give it to you again when you meet the man. It will help you stay calm. But the parcel wasn't listening. In my village, she said, there was this girl. There was this girl three years older than me. She had to get married to an old man. You're not getting married, said Madhu. I will get married many times, said the parcel. Yes, said Madhu. Then, not knowing what else to do, Madhu showed the parcel her photograph. Here, she said, this is the one I will be sending. When the parcel saw it, she stared at it for a few seconds. Then she slowly reached out, took the phone in both hands, and placed it in her lap. It was as though she was talking to herself in the picture, telling herself she would be fine. It was a moment of intense concentration between two girls. The girl in the photograph was the one who would be hurt, but the girl sitting on the bed was the one who would feel the pain. Thank you. So just a sense there of the horror that's to come. And uh, I note that one of your reviewers said that uh, you were not exactly selling vacation dreams. And uh, talk about understatement. I mean, it's, it's the, the horror is, 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 is deeply uncomfortable. This is not a comfortable read. Um, it's bonded slavery, quite literally. Uh, it's extremely violent child abuse. Um, what was your intent as a writer in dealing with something so horrific? My intent was to be as truthful as possible. You know, I did not choose this subject matter because um, I thought it would be shocking. You know, I, I, that's not why, why I write. And again, I always use this quote by Tennessee Williams where he says that when someone asked him, you know, your work is shocking. Um, he said, I, I don't think of it that way. I just want to tell the truth and the truth is shocking. And, and that's really my intention with this. All I had to do is just, unfortunately, hold a mirror that reflects what goes on in, in this place. And I've, I've been familiar with Kamadipura for many, many years because I was born very close to it. So from the time I was born till was about seven or eight, I lived just about a few hundred meters away. And then even as, you know, as an adult, I would always pass through it and somehow that place uh, stayed with me. I think it haunted me and in some ways it inspired me as well and I just wanted to to share that with the reader. Just hold a mirror. 
Thank you. I want to listen to your reading now, Sandy, but I want to hear from uh, one of your characters, Avinash, who is a wonderful guy. The, the great tragedy, I, I really warmed to him, but the great tragedy of this character is that we as readers know him better than his own family knows him. So his life is shrouded in these, these terrifying secrets. And there's a very beautiful scene I'd like you to read now where he's, he's starting to, to come out and discover his sexuality. Yeah, so this is a scene um, that takes place in a hair salon. And it's when Avinash is a young boy. And I should say that usually he hated getting his hair cut. And then one day he goes into this salon and he sees a new barber has come. And the new barber is very dashing and kind of handsome. And suddenly Avinash doesn't know why, but he really wants to get a haircut again. So barely a week later, Avinash decided that his hair was too long and he needed a haircut. He walked by the Badsha saloon three times to make sure that Aziz had a customer and Sultan was free. Sultan is the barber he likes. Then glancing around to see that no one was looking, he walked in as nonchalantly as he could. Sultan was reading the newspaper and looked up as Avinash came in. If he was surprised to see him, he didn't show it. He put the paper down and said, haircut? Avinash nodded, not quite trusting himself to speak. Sultan was wearing a dark blue shirt and brown pants of some slightly shiny material. Avinash could see the blue straps of his sandals. The shirt was not tucked in and the first two buttons were as usual undone. Inside he wore a white vest. Avinash could see a few strands of chest hair peeping over the top of his vest and for some inexplicable reason that made his heart pound. Avinash had seen the hair on his father's chest many times but it had never made his heart go faster. He wondered if Sultan would notice that he too had left one button undone on his own shirt or that his pants were a little too tight but Sultan did not say anything. Sit down, he said, pointing to a chair. Avinash sat down and then said, oh, I must not spoil this shirt with hair. Can I take it off? Yes, but you'll get hair all over yourself then. I know, but my mother would kill me if I get hair all over the shirt. Sultan shrugged and handed him a hanger. Avinash started unbuttoning his shirt, sure that his ears were bright red. As he sat down on the chair again, he saw in the mirror his scrawny body, the flat chest with all the ribs showing through his white banyan, and he wished he'd kept his shirt on, but it was too late. Sultan was preparing to drape the big white sheet around him. Avinash felt Sultan's fingers knotted behind his neck, then his hands patting the sheet down over his body. His heart was racing like an express train. Sultan opened his drawer, took out his scissors and clippers. So how do you want it, short? Avinash wanted to say, like yours. Sultan's hair was brushed up in front and carefully styled at the back so it curled over his collars. His sideburns were long and angled, but Avinash knew that was never going to work as long as there were hair checks. He went to a school where they had hair check days to make sure you know, your hair didn't go over your collar. Yes, short, Avinash said, resigned. Sultan started humming a song as he began to snip the hair on the back of his head. Avinash sat there, watching him through the mirror, as if memorizing him. The packet of cigarettes that showed through his shirt pocket, the watch with its stainless steel band, the golden chain always around his neck. Avinash tilted his head slightly to get a better view of him. Hold still now, Sultan said, holding him in place. The touch of his hand was warm and rough, almost electric against his skin. And Avinash suddenly had a vision of holding his hand to his nose. What would it smell of, tobacco and hair cream? He was acutely aware of his bare body under the shirt. Though there was no air conditioner, Avinash could feel goosebumps on his arms. Sultan, I'm going to get some tea, Aziz said. That's the other barber conveniently leaving the shop now. OK, can you get me a cup too? Then he looked at Avinash and said, do you want some? I don't drink tea, Avinash said without thinking, and then instantly regretted it. Oh, are you still drinking milk, said Aziz, laughing. You're getting a mustache now. When will you start drinking tea? Let him be, Sultan said. Look how skinny he is. He needs milk. Now Avinash really wished he had never taken off his shirt. He watched Aziz leave the shop, the swivel dough swinging behind him. Sultan was standing beside him. Now his body turned towards him as he cut his hair. His chest was at the level of his eyes. 
Avinash could see every strand of black silky hair pushing past the confines of Sultan's vest. Avinash wondered what it would be like to touch them. Would he get hair on his chest too? His fingers itched to play with Sultan's chest hair. Avinash edged his hands forward so that his fingers were almost touching Sultan's leg. Sultan moved forward. Avinash's clenched knuckles grazed his pants. Sultan made no attempt to move his leg away. His heart beating with some delectable fear, Avinash left his hand there. As Sultan leaned in to trim his hair, his legs pressed against Sult Avinash's knuckles. Avinash found himself wondering if his legs were hairy too. He felt he was sweating, and then he felt cold. Sultan raised his arm to hold his head firmly, and Avinash could see the dark half moon of the shadow of sweat on his arm, in his armpit. Oh, you are very fidgety, Sultan said. <laughs> wow, very racy for a Monday morning. Woo, okay. <laughs> um, and before you ask anything, this is not autobiographical. Oh, you're probably bored of that question. I wasn't going to ask that question, <laughs> but I'm glad that's out there. No, I, thought, I just thought he was such a dashing figure. And the character of Avinash is, is, is one that you really feel an affection for. And the thing that he highlights very importantly for me is the vulnerability of being gay in the time in which he lives. And I wonder if you would talk around the scene which you later describe. Um, there's a, there's a, a terrible act of violence committed against him, uh, which he's both a victim of, of male sexual violence, but also a victim of, of society in the sense that he's open to a blackmail. Can you talk about that, please? Yeah, thanks, B. The scene that she's talking about is, I'll, I'll give you a little backdrop of the character. You know, I am happy to give away chunks of the book because it's written in short stories forms. You know, it's a novel in short stories. So, um, you learn the secrets very quickly. And see, Avinash is a gay man who is married to a woman, which is not an uncommon scenario in our country. And uh, the tragedy that, of Avinash is that by the time he is able to access a gay world in India through the internet and all of that, he's already, you know, he's already married a long time. He has a grown son. So he's part of a really tantalizing and, to me, a poignant generation. It's, it's almost naive. Yeah, so, you know, there, is, there was an older generation that had no access, you know, <clears throat> they may never have found out other gay people. They knew that it was their sexuality. It was kept locked up in them. If they went to a cruising area in a park and stumbled upon someone, perhaps they would find somebody, but in general, you know, that was it. They, they figured that was their lot in life. Now, there are young people who from, you know, as teenagers go online, they can find groups, you know, they can meet people through online, even at least have virtual friendships with other men or women like them. Avinash was the in-between generation. Yeah, it doesn't go well for it, him. But, so when he comes into this, so he encounters this gay Bombay group, and he goes to one of their parties, and I... <clears throat> You know, the figure of the married gay man is often a, a villain as figure. You know, he's like the bad guy in society, someone who's cheating a woman. So I understand that. But I was always struck by the image of an, someone like Avinash walking into a gay party in Bombay full of gay men who are dancing and the music is playing and him realizing that this is within his reach and yet just tantalizingly out of it. You know, he's, as an older gay man, he's outside that scene. And that leads him to an act where he, you know, encounters a young man who he thinks is interested in him, but then gets blackmailed by him. And as a married man, a respectable middle-class married man, he's immensely vulnerable to this blackmail. And that's why I wanted, as a, as a reader for people, to, you know, you could condemn Avinash for his choice in getting married, but that doesn't prevent you from understanding the poignancy of his situation of watching this world in front of him that he can almost taste, but it's like, you know, like a kid with his face against a window. Mm -hmm. And I love that it, I mean, to the, the extent to which it reveals that every family is not what it appears. And I want to return to you now and, and the subject of families because Madhu creates a family. She is indeed part of a very hierarchical, very powerful family unit. Can you describe the way that the Hidra family works? Sure. So 
the the word hijra actually comes from i mean no one really knows the exact origin of the word but um, it is said to have been derived from the urdu phrase hijrat karna which means to migrate and in a sense hijras are migratory beings they are constantly trying to find home not just within their own bodies um, but also in society and unfortunately madhu was someone who had been rejected by her her family by her, her parents because they saw the madhu was born a boy and they they knew that this was a feminine soul you know the soul was in a way trapped in the wrong body and the parents did not understand how to accept that so madhu tried to find home within the hijra community and uh, the hijra community in india is very unique because it is defined by a guru disciple relationship you know you you can only be initiated into the hijra community by a hijra guru in this case in the novel that person the character's name is gurumai and the gurumai ends up being the spiritual guide the mother the father the protector employer and exploiter all in one and madhu when he runs away from home as a young boy is, is only 13 or 14 and then joins this community of hijras longs for that feeling of home but now in the novel she's 40 years old and she still feels she hasn't found uh, there that is a, sense. there's a moment at which she says um she's like she, she has you know the parcel to look after and she says she knows that she doesn't need a traditional man and a child to make her into a woman but at, at some sense there is a yearning there's yes. a very powerful yearning to have that sort of that unit yes she's she's you know she she says there's that sometimes life offers you a lesser version of a dream you know and she chooses to take it in the sense that uh, by looking after this young girl if she feels like a mother for some time that's okay if if that's all life is going to give her then she embraces that and accepts that and in a way it's she's she's also a character who has tremendous self loathing um and this this longing for acceptance and love and she finds it um through this this young girl i found her very compellingly drawn you know she's an extraordinary character a very powerful character thank you there is of course the question though of how you as a writer can fully know the sort of internal landscape of someone's life like that you know it's the question of of you know of appropriation of someone's sure. story because the trans the trans community the hijra community are a very excluded indeed a very stigmatized story so how do you answer the idea of how you can write that story sure so again for me to begin with i would have never written this novel if i hadn't been born just opposite kamadi pura so you know when i was a kid i used to stand outside the gates of the compound where i lived and right opposite me there was this convent school and every evening sex workers used to line up against the wall of the convent school and i used to see uh, hijras um, as well there was a cinema called the alexander cinema there and i remember you know i didn't know it was the red light district but that was the terrain of my childhood in a way and were you afraid i wasn't afraid no that's the thing i wasn't afraid i i always had questions that why is their life so different from mine you know i i used to play cricket i used to you know i had a family that loved me i they used to fly kites there was so much freedom when i was growing up but at the same time there was this longing to understand this need to understand these people and you i i always feel that one cannot write out of mere fascination i think it's not enough to be curious uh it's not enough to be fascinated or to say i'm really interested in the transgender community therefore i should be able to write about them no that can be a starting point but i was absolutely compelled and the reason for that was i as i grew up i began to understand that you know some of these women are not sex workers they're sex slaves you know they are being tortured and and these are girls who are almost 10 years old so is there an the element same... of campaigning well I don't you, think of it as that I think it's outrage as a human being it's not you know there's no you sometimes your body tells you what to do and outrage is a good word actually because yeah. almost every page is sort of infused with a sense of of disgust and horror and you know the 
the women are compared to, you know, vectors of disease, to insect, the sewage everywhere. You know, there's a rat chomping a used condom, yeah. you know. And, and I want to ask you, where do you locate that disgust? Is it in us as the reader? Do you confess that you are mildly disgusted, or is that, is that the view of society projected onto this community? You know, I, I felt very, very helpless and powerless. I realized how useless I am and powerless I am as a person while I was researching this. And that's the other thing. It took me a long, long time. I, did, I tried my best not to write this book. It took me more than 10 years to put a single word to the page because I knew it was a huge responsibility. But again, I was compelled because I'm writing also as a witness, you know, and, and that gave me that permission to write. I also feel one needs to, um, I, I spoke to members of the Hijra community. So there's a whole series of things that I did to make sure I got it right. And eventually I think you, you have to forget all that. After, when you're writing, you have to be fearless mm -hmm. and leave all of that behind and just try to find depth and portray them as, as human beings. Because that was the outrage that I was feeling, that these are fully formed human beings. You know, just because someone is, is transgendered or they belong to the Hijra community, we've sort of unconsciously pushed them into the shadows. But if we want to see what we have suppressed as human beings, you have to look into the shadow world. You know? What do you think Madhu would think of the book? I think Madhu would, you know, it's ha it probably has I, some expletives in you it, know, right? Yeah, well, she, you know, she sort of, I, I like this word unleashed because that's what happened with her. When, when I started writing her, she unleashed herself onto the page. You know, it was almost like a coiled snake suddenly just, that has been kept tight for so long, suddenly just coming out. And that's, that's the way I, I wanted this book to be. Not consciously, that's what happened because I wrote this really quickly but I did, didn't write a word for almost a decade. Gosh. Um, I want to pick up on your idea of, of a woman's character as a, as, a, as, a, as a tense, coiled spring waiting to be unleashed, and I want to return to your character, Romola, um, who is the wife of Avinash, the gay protagonist, and she's just a wonderful character. Um, the opening scene is a pure delight. It's the beginning of the book, and it describes, it sort of foreshadows the transgressions and the secrets that will come later. Do you want to tell us about the scene, the McDonald's scene? <laughs> I love it. That's one little bit of the book that has an element of autobiography in it. So I used to live in the San Francisco for many, many years. And uh, the first time my parents came to visit, you know, I had these, all these fancy restaurants I had lined up to take them to. I'll take you one night to a Thai place. One night we'll go for a Korean barbecue. You know, one night we'll go for French. And then at one point, my mother very timidly said, well, one day, could we go to McDonald's? <gasps> You know, at that time, McDonald's had not come to India. And for her, it felt like, you know, the going all the way to America and not eating at a McDonald's was just, you know, it's pointless going. It was not worth the price of the ticket. You know, what would people say when she came back to India and confessed she'd never been to a McDonald's? So that had always struck, stuck she, with she's me. She's terrified. Rommel is terrified, terrified, isn't she? So it had stuck with me. And eventually I said, okay, yeah, we'll be, you know, driving from San Francisco to LA one day and we'll stop at a drive out and get your McDonald's fix done. And of course, they kind of hated it when they got it because the burger, it all looked smaller, flatter, and the ketchup oozing out and the little flat meat patty. It was not, nothing as juicy as the pictures. But that memory had stuck with me. And in my book, Romola has arrived and she's sort of a recently widowed character. And she has voluntarily decided to stop eating meat and fish after her husband dies, as people used to do at one time. It's m much rarer now. But at one point, she gets really sick of everybody assuming things about her, that this is, a, you know, this is how she will behave, assuming she'll have the salad when she thinks, like, you know, Indians often think, like, what is salad? But, you know, food that cows eat. It's like gas poos. Um, but in, in, here in my book, Romola decides to secretly go to McDonald's by herself because you, nobody in the family will take her because they all assume. And so I, it was lovely to set the scene in here where she goes in and then she's like thrust into the middle of an all-American experience and can't figure out what, and I'll just give the little 
interesting when the girl at the counter says, as they often say in America, um, for here to go, you know, when you're giving the order, whether you want to eat in or take out, but they say it together, right? So they say, for here to go. And Romola doesn't understand, so she doesn't know what to say. And the girl says, for here to go. And then she finally just says, yes, because she hopes that's the right answer. <laughs> and uh, that, to me, in fact, the book's original sort of working title for me was for here to okay. go. But uh, in India, people don't say that, so then we change it to don't let him okay, know. Okay. But it's, it's, that was a priceless moment, and, and again, it recurs, there's a, there's a grandmother figure who keeps a secret stash of mango chutney under, under the mattress of her bed. And it's, you know, that speaks to, you know, women's relationship with food and expectations on gender and how she, particularly, as you said, as a widow, expectations are put on her and no one actually ever asks her, and she wants to be asked. And that, so then her journey is a remarkable one. She knows her husband is gay. She's complicit in the secret and, you know, has lived through that. Um, and right towards the end, she has this, I don't want to put in any spoiler, no. <laughs> it's really, I, I don't want to, you know, obviously you've got to buy the book and read it. Um, but there's this fantastic scene in the aforementioned Carbondale uh, Midwestern town. I wonder why she... that town never asked me to come back and do a reading. I mean, I don't think it's been on the literary I map. Think, up I think, I think ever. there should be a nightclub <laughs> named after you there. She winds up in a gay bar and she winds up singing Miranam Chim Chim Chu with this wonderful trans person and they have this whole Helen routine and it's, it's quite gorgeous. And you know then that she's okay, but the irony being that she finds solace and redemption in a gay bar. She's not herself gay. Talk about that, please. Yeah, I, I mean, for me, Romola was always, I mean, the book was, uh, there are three main characters, Romola, Avinash, and their son, Amit. And um, Romola was always, for me, the character, who, the character whose journey I wanted to follow from the in the book, from the moment she discovers by opening a letter by mistake that her husband might have had a male lover. And what she does with that secret, as we said, this book is about secrets, and you know, some secrets are, terrifying and dark and they destroy family. Some secrets like the great grandmother with her stash of chutney and pickles under the bed are delicious and they kind of keep the family together. And I wanted to deal with this idea in, even in coming out and talking about sexuality. In, in the West, often the coming out is a singular moment. You know, you, it's best exemplified like you come out to the family, then you buy that one-way ticket on a bus, and you move from a town like Carbondale to San Francisco or New York or Toronto and, you know, to lead the, the gay life, as it were. In India, people have often said that when you come out of the closet, the whole family goes into the closet with you. So, you know, because then it becomes the family secret, you know, and then everyone becomes a custodian of the secret and it becomes entirely about from coming out becomes an act of like everyone saying like, okay, now we know, but don't let them know. You know, it's all about protecting, it's a protective gesture, but it's a protective as a family. And in a way, Ramula exemplifies that, that when she discovers the secret about her husband, she doesn't know what to do. I mean, there's no like help group or she's any. kind of trapped by she's that secret. She's kind of secret, trapped isn't by she? that secret. She can't even share it with her own family because she carries that stigma and shame of that secret because now it's about her husband, you know, and she's stuck with with that. So she deals with it in her own way by sort of going into the closet, as it were, with him. And in the book, you're never entirely sure whether the husband realizes that she knows this about him, you know, and different people have had different interpretations. And I wanted to leave that open because I think in our families, even though we are such a family-centric culture, secrets are huge in the families and the families function in this way about all the things you half know about people in your family and, uh, you know, that you don't talk about. It's our families are bristling with things we don't want to talk about. And we stub our toes on them all the time. And yet to all appearances, you know, when we are at going eating out at a restaurant, we're just a very happy middle class Indian family. Until a writer comes along and takes the lid off. <laughs> and that's why people hate writers. <laughs> uh, Anosh, I want to come back to you. And an interesting quote by Gurumai, she says, um, she describes, it's just one line. The third world is not a place, it's a gender. 
What does that mean? You know, so again, it, it goes to this, you know, hijras don't think of themselves as male or female. Um, and, and it's this place, it's, the, the, it's a venue, you know, where you discover things about yourself, where uh, you find family. So what Guruma is saying is, is actually it's a gender. It's a third world because it's an entire universe that, as you say, has been kept secret for so many years inside this young boy. Uh, but finally, when he is allowed to enter that universe, everything opens up, up for him. And the first time Gurumai uh, sees Madhu uh, in the novel, there used to be, or there still is, this uh, sweet shop uh, just outside the red light district uh, called Gita Bhavan, where I used to go as a kid, and they used to have the best rasgullas and gulab jamuns and, and all of that. In the novel, that's uh, Madhu's father, and Madhu is only 12 years old at the time, and Madhu's father tells him, go get some sweets for me. And he goes and he's, he's eating rasgullas there, and Guruma is there with two other hijra, uh, you know, uh, disciples of hers, and she looks at Madhu and says, kya chikni? Which means, chikni means the smooth one, obviously, uh, but chikni is the female, uh, is the feminine, uh, she, she addresses Manu, uh, Madhu as, as, as female. And Madhu doesn't understand. She's claiming Madhu. She, yes, she recognizes something in Madhu. And, and Madhu is, is sort of relieved at the same time terrified. Then she's relieved and terrified. She's relieved and terrified. Mm. Did you no, want to? I, I wanted to add, when you said that, it struck me that, you know, um, as a growing up in Calcutta, as a young boy, you know, as someone coming to terms with my own sexuality and, you know, realizing I was gay, I'm not Avinash. But I, I, you know, I did you know, I come out at a, to myself at a time when there was not very much around me in terms of resources and stuff. But I used to be terrified of hijras because I felt, A, they were so out there and open about their sexuality. And I was terrified that, you know, for um, people like me being gay, you could you spend all your time concealing it because you spent all your time trying to pass as somebody, quote unquote, normal. And I was always terrified that the hijra would know that I was lying. And that, so whenever the hijra would come to the house or to the car window, I would want to look away and not meet their eyes because I felt like they could see into me and kind of strip me naked in a certain way and expose me to the world and claim me. It's exactly what, as, as you described. So there's a kind of um, unseen electricity of, of a connection, a potential connection, a look, an understanding, which I think is actually featured in, in, bo in both of your works very beautifully. But I do want to go back to this uh, third world is not a place, it's a gender. This is, you know, gender is in the title of this panel. And I believe I'm the only woman on this panel. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, <laughs> Can I ask you to talk about gender as, you know, as a construct or as, a, as an innate? Is that something that you've explored? Sorry, can you be a little more? Yes. Like in what, the, uh, gender, I mean, you, you, you talk about fluidity. Yes. At what point is it, inna is it innate? So uh, what are the fixed points? You know, it, again, I, I, don't, I didn't place myself in the novel uh, at, at any point, but when it came to to Madhu, there's there's a transition. You know, there is fluidity. If right in the beginning of the novel, uh, she says that my body is now blackmailing me. You know, the the fact that I try to get rid of the masculinity mm -hmm. within me now the ma the male part is seeking revenge, and and I used to look like a beautiful woman as a hijra. I was a beautiful woman in my youth. Now the masculine part of me is reclaiming my body and is, is making me look uh, odd and weird. Mm. So there's this constant change in, in, in terms of Madhu uh, being a hijra. She's born a boy, she's a soul trapped in the wrong body according to her. Mm. Uh, she lives as a boy until she's 12, until this moment where Guru, Guru Mai recognizes her mm. and she's seen for the first time, but she doesn't, uh, doesn't know what to do with that until at 14 she gets herself castrated 
you know, and, and there's this thing within the Hijra community that, you know, when they castrate the person, they have to make sure that the blood, the impure blood during that ceremony is the impure male part that is being driven away. That is, so you get cleansed of the impure male part. Mm -hmm. And then now in her 40s, she feels she's becoming more and more male again. So it's a spectrum. It, it is a spectrum. And Sandeep, especially can you talk to that? You know, as if there's, you know, in, within gender, is there, you know, almost like a Kinsey scale of, you know, a, a, a spectrum? Yeah, I think there is a spectrum. Um, we just position ourselves very fixedly at certain points of that spectrum. And I think what in my book I was interested in exploring is the, you know, the roles and responsibilities that suddenly get assigned to you by virtue of your gender. You know, so mm, Romola, when she discovers her husband's sexuality, reacts to it in a certain way that are, is prescribed to her by the expectations of uh, her gender. You know, as a woman, you know, she still sort of sees herself as the one who is meant to hold this family mm. together. And so because she believes that is her gender assigned role, and then she does that. And so, in fact, towards the end of the book, when I was writing the last story, the last story was the one written absolutely at the end. You know, the other stories were written at different points, but the last chapter, I thought about, you know, where do I leave Romola? And it struck me that that gay bar in Carbondale with this drag queen Wonderland. named Bang Bangladesh and singing Meranam Chinchinchu spoke a lot about that gender, you know, the role journey she's traveled, where she then now meets this woman whom she doesn't first realize is a drag queen. Mm -hmm. And that it, it sort of muddles her ideas of, you know, shows her that the gender thing itself has a bit of a spectrum and there is some fluidity and movement possible. It does, but I would point out that both of your female protagonists, and, and you know, no spoilers, but the, the traditional uh, female attribute, if you like, or the role of, of self-sacrifice is key. That's key, you know, the female children, the female protagonists throughout. So that's something that's that... Because, that's because my mother always, you know, an Indian mother, especially a Bengali mother, oh. is like the queen of self-sacrifice. Self-sacrifice <laughs> is the weapon with, is wielded oh. like a weapon and it keeps the family in line. If you argue with my mother, she will say, okay, well, you know, whatever I have done, whatever I need to do, you all are all grown up now, you know best, it's okay. I will not say anything and then proceed to talk for the next five minutes about not saying anything until you just give up and say like, oh, yes. yes, you know, I gave up my career. I, I feel that's hitting a bit of a nerve with the audience. I want at this point to, uh, to reach out and see, are there any questions for the panel, please? Uh, one's already, this person already got one at the back, gentleman with the beard. Two questions. One, have you read the book or to the, any hedges or uh, at any settings like this and what was their reaction? And I'm, I'm sorry, I couldn't, I can't hear ha you. Have any hedges uh, read the book, reviewed the book? Uh, what was their reaction? And well, yeah. the other question is, uh, after it goes through the sex change, do you think she still contains uh, sort of male personality in that she's sort of dominant in how the book resolves itself. What was the second? Okay, so, so the first question was, have Hidras read and reviewed the book? What was their response? The second question was, do you think that Madhu, having undergone a sex change, having been castrated, does she still retain male attributes of dominance and a, a forceful personality? Okay, so I'll answer your first uh, question. The thing is, I, I, I don't know if... Uh, any uh, hijra person has read has read my novel, but I did, um, you know, after I wrote a couple of drafts of the parcel, I did specifically speak with one person who used to work uh, as a sex worker who was uh, transgender, and she worked in Kamatipura for a while, and I sort of told her what I'm working on, and it, it gave, that gave me a lot of confidence, because I knew I was on the right track in terms of authenticity. And she was wonderful in the way she opened sort of her heart and mind, you know, to me and was very gracious. Uh, so in that sense, I was able to ask her questions 
and get her views on, on what I was doing. I've also written a non-fiction piece on her which will be published uh, in, the, in the coming months. Um, but no, I don't know if anyone has read it. I, I hope they have, but I haven't heard. Okay. It's, it's hard to... And to the second question? Yeah. The, the second question is, you know, again, it, like I said, it's... Um, the second question was, sorry, I'm... Was the it, male, yeah, dominance, male dominance and you know, some it's, attributes. It's hard, it's hard to say because she, she, there's a lot of self-loathing. And, and whether it's male or female, what stays with her is this longing for love, this need for, for acceptance. And what she realizes is no matter what she does to her body, until her soul gets acceptance, she will never be free. Whether it is done via, uh, you know, whether she's male, whether she's female, or whether she's a hijra, it's the soul that needs freedom. So the gender eventually doesn't matter to her. It's this longing for love and acceptance. Uh, that is the, the key force that operates within her. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Okay. At the front. Oh, sorry. We'll come to you next, um, then you. Good morning, you sir. I love the way you wrote that third world is not a place, it's a gender. My question to you is, you wrote this book. Both of you are gay, uh, writing on things which are stereotypical still for the Indian society. So what was the reactions of your family and your friends? after you showed them that you were working on something like this? Because you said that uh, they're supposed to keep it a secret. So what was their reactions? Sandeep, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, Thank you. You know, this is my first book. And I think the terrifying thing about it is in my, my, when my mother said, w when I first landed the book deal, my mother was terribly excited. Then that war, you know, so she told all the required aunts, you know, that my son has whatever. Um, I, even though she had been so closeted about me being a writer for a long time after I quit my software world. But anyway, um, but once that excitement wore off, one day she asked me very carefully, so what is this book about? <laughs> and, and I was like, oh, family. <laughs> and then she, uh, she, so then I gave her the draft to read and um, she read it and she didn't, you know, she didn't say anything about it. She was just, um, there is a scene, chapter where there is the, the, the character Romola is tussling and fighting all the time with the great grandmother in the thing. And that is based on my own great grandmother I knew. And my mother loved that chapter. And she said, I love that chapter. But you know, I was never that mean to your great grandmother. Aww. And that's when I get to say, like, no, ma, I mean, that, this is fiction. And so once I established that, I think she could take comfort in the fact that everything else was fiction and not try to map, say, my life and my coming out, my sexuality onto what was happening in the book. But in terms of relevance, one thing I'll tell you is that thank you for asking that question because when I wrote this book, it had been written over a long period of time. And I felt that India had changed a lot in that period. You know, Section 377 was being talked about on television uh, all the time. There were petitions in Supreme Court. There were gay pride marches in all the cities. So I'm like, how relevant is this book about a married man, you know, with the dealing with his sexuality in today's India? And uh, the book, like months after this book came out, there was a case in Delhi at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences where a young woman committed suicide because she's a doctor, because she found her husband, who is also a doctor, was a gay man, and had been, you know, she sort of looked at his WhatsApp or something and realized he'd been having, still continuing to have affairs with men all through their marriage, and she killed herself, and I remember Everybody said, you know, in this day and age, why did she have to commit suicide? You know, there are, you should divorce him, separate, whatever. And with this book just freshly out, I, I was struck by the fact, you know, everyone's asking why did she have to commit suicide? Why is no one asking in this day and age, why did he have to get married? Mm -hmm. And that's when I realized that, you know, you know, ma being married is also a certain sexuality in our country. You know, you like, this is something, this is a sign of growing up, and that pressure of marriage is still really, really strong. And I, and I, I love what you said, uh, you know, why did he have to get married? And I think that's the function of literature. Literature needs to address these questions and, and open the world up just a little more. 
you know, so people understand and are able to talk about these things. And storytelling is a great way to do that. Fiction is a great way to do that. Because when you're reading a novel, somehow you can place yourself inside there. Mm -hmm. When it's non-fiction, it's harder because you know it's someone else's story and it's a true story. And fiction is also incredibly truthful, but as a reader, somehow you slip in. You know, you position yourself, you allow yourself to imagine um, what someone else's consciousness is like. And I think that's really, really important to move forward just inch by inch, and it will take time. Yes, uh, there was a question here. My question's for Anush. Uh, do you feel the burden of appropriating a community which you do not belong to while having written this book? And my second question is to the entire panel. You know, while writing literature which deals with gender, how important do you people think it is to deal, uh, uh, to engage with other structures uh, like caste, class, and race while nuancing gender? Wow, big questions. Okay, the first well, one is I'll, about I'll take the first part. It, it wasn't a burden at all, it's a privilege. You know, to, to be able to write about the hijra community, I was honored to do that, and I consider it a privilege. I, you know, when you, the hijra community is a community that is on the fringes of society, they're in, in the shadows, and they have a great vantage point that will enable us to learn about ourselves. So when I was writing this book, uh, not only did I learn about the hijra community, but I also learned about myself and society as well. So in that sense, it was, um, an, an absolute privilege. I, the I point she's making, if, if, you, yeah. if you'll let me jump in, cultural appropriation is if somebody is excluded or disadvantaged and you're taking their voice and arguably you're either using it for power or to make money, then you are kind of stealing their product. No, I, I don't think so because I was also a witness. Their story is very much my story. So if I, had, like I said in the beginning, if I had just written this out of mere fascination, then I would have not had the confidence to pursue this in the first place. But being a child, being present in the red light district, one of my earliest childhood memories is walking through Kamadipura. And I, it's just a snapshot of the brothels from a height in the middle of the afternoon. And I remember it from a height because my mother was carrying me. And so it goes back to my childhood. This novel is very much a product of my own childhood. And that has given me the permission uh, to write. And then it is also privilege. Okay, and your second question was, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, if we're writing about gender, to what extent should we also feel the responsibility to include caste power relationships? Um, in my, I, I agree with you, because I think these are all interconnected and complicated things. But in the end, when I'm writing the book, I'm, you know, I'm just telling a story. Um, I don't think I'm even thinking that it, this is a book about sexuality or gender or any. Everything that comes out happens as a result of the story. My intention is not to write a book about sexuality. Because I think for me, that would paralyze me instantly because I would be in instantly aware of all my shortcomings, of all the things I'm not addressing. So, yeah, you know, this is a very upper middle class Bengali family. We are not really dealing with caste in the sense. But class comes in, in the section that I read about the barber shop, it's actually a story also about attraction across class lines. You know, Avinash you know, is unable to articulate his desire because it's for a man, but he's even more unable to articulate it because it's for a man who belongs to a lower class background than his. So when he run, when he's out shopping with his mother in the market, and runs into Sultan sitting there smoking a cigarette. He wants to go up to him and talk to him, but he can't do it in front of his mother because, you know, it would be like, how do you know a man like this, you know, with his shirt buttons open and sitting and smoking on a rock and using slang, bad words. So class, all of that kind of creeps into the book, but I feel like, you know, if, if I tried to do it very explicitly by design, I would start floundering. Is there anything you wanted to add to that? No, Anush? I think he's answered yeah. it really Any well. Any more questions? Oh, sorry? I think there's a woman there. Oh, right, what would I say to that? I'd say, you know, it, you can't do everything. <laughs> We're trying. <laughs> I mean, you, you, it's, it, you, you hinted at this, Anosh. There are so many critics in your head 
when you write. You, you, you can't really serve every population. You just have to try and write about the thing that you want to write about, whilst not annihilating anybody else. I don't know if that uh, answers your question. Can you just stay with the character? I think that's what you do. You know, your literary fiction is really character-driven fiction, yes. and you stay with the character as a human being. We have a question here. Yeah. Hello, thank you. We have competing questions. I belong to this Rajasthan. I'm sorry? I belong to Rajasthan. Rajasthan. And I visited so many areas in Rajasthan when I was the chairperson of the Women Commission. Any positive suggestion? How to bring them in the mainstream of the society? How to bring them in the mainstream of the society? What they desire? They want to come out or any support structure or lack of the su support structure they want to continue. They have no any option. Second, uh, in Dhalpur side and some other areas, very, you will surprise us, uh, declining sex ratio in Rajasthan and other parts of the India. And in those areas, I asked them how many children you have, 12 very poor conditions, and why 12? So first nine are the boys, and they are not our income source. So last three, they are the daughters. So why generation to generation? So gender-based violence also there due to this. Gender does violence, yeah. and you're, you, you're yeah. bringing it out into the to rural communities. Yeah. Do you want to yes. respond to that? particular Sunday? communities in Rajasthan. I think I'll, I'll just quickly respond to your first question is what is required? You said what is needed. Uh, I, I think more than anything, we, we need to understand them. It is, it is up to us to, for example, understand the transgender community. You know, it's, the onus is not just on them. It, it's, we should have a little more empathy or compassion or uh, a, a desire to understand them because as I said in understanding them I understood myself more I understood my shortcomings my strengths my weaknesses more and more um, and there was one more thing I, I'd like to say that may not directly answer your question but it needs to be said because we're talking about gender is when I was doing research for this book um, what I discovered was that women were just as responsible as men when it came to sex trafficking. And that shocked me. I, I wasn't expecting that. And, and that's something that I still can't bring my head around. And again, it goes to the fixed notion of, of woman as mother, as nurturer. But this completely threw me off of balance. And uh, that was something that I, you know, th so th those were things that I still haven't found an answer for, just like virtually everything else in this book. Anybody else? Oh, if somebody at the edge here. I recently came across this article with a very striking uh, title in the Washington Post, and I'd like to get your views on it. It read, India has outlawed homosexuality, but it is better to be homosexual in India than in the US. So I'd like to than get your, the, than, than in the, the US. US. I, I, I like haven't read the article, you know, as a journalist, I know we put clickbait headlines all the time which have nothing. So, so I can't comment on the content of the article which I haven't read. Um, as somebody who has lived in India and in the US, I'll say that one of the biggest things in, in India at a certain time, you could get away with a lot of it because it was a culture that was more homo-ignorant than homophobic. Huh. So, um, you know, but we still, and now it's changing. There's much more awareness of it. It's coming out in papers and things like that. But still to this day, if I am in a big city in India and I have a male partner and I am looking to rent a place or move into an apartment, it is 10 times more easy for me to do this than if I was trying to do it with a woman whom I was not married to at the, at, you know, at the time. I can go to a hotel in Bombay with a man, like my boyfriend, and we will check into like a small hotel, no problems asked. I have been at that very same hotel and watched a young couple who were on a honeymoon apparently being asked to show their marriage certificate oh. before they would be given their room. So yes, in some ways, you know, some things, you know, not necessarily for the good reasons, 
but in some ways it just so happens that it's easier to use your privilege in a certain way. There's, um, we're going to have to wrap it up now. The, the staff are waiting in the wings. I know we're being urged off, but I think the moral of this entire debate is that more people need to read more books. And with that, I urge you to go to the bookshop and buy Anosh Irani and Sandeep Roy's books. They're both outstanding. Buying books is a good thing. It's like feeding us. It keeps us alive. Um, and thank you to my wonderful panelists. Give them a huge round of applause. Thank you.